This beautiful piece of equipment is a 1913 Model 8 Linotype. The Linotype was invented by a German immigrant named Ottmar Mergenthaler in about 1885. Mr. Mergenthaler came to the United States. Uh, he had been trained in Germany in, in machining and watchmaking and engraving, things like that. He worked at a, what was then known as a patent model shop. In order to get a patent on any piece of equipment, you had to supply a working model. And in that shop, he was exposed to the early beginnings of typewriters. And so he was familiar with uh, what they could do and couldn't do. He often had to repair or modify the plans of a patent applicant because it wouldn't work. That said, we get to the Model 8. The difference between the Model 8 and the Model 5 is the Model 5 only had one magazine. And we'll get into the purpose of that in a little bit. But the basic operation of the machine is that the operator sits here. He keys in whatever the story that uh, the editors have decided they want. And so we come to the keyboard. Now the keyboard is not a typewriter QWERTY keyboard because the, uh, the purpose of the QWERTY keyboard was to slow the operator down so they didn't jam all the keys up. This machine doesn't have that fault. It also doesn't have a shift key, so that's why we have the lowercase letters, the uppercase letters, and in the center we have what are called small caps, figures, printer's word for numbers, uh, points, which would be the usual punctuation stuff in there. So by operating the keyboard, it's merely telling the machine to take a mold for the letter from the magazine up here, takes it down to the assembly area. The mold, sometimes called a matrix, is this piece here. There's the casting end of it. You can see the letter right there. They sit in 90 channels in the magazine. They sit on edge. So when you strike, and this would be the small m, you hit that, the machine will send this down to the assembly area. When the line has been assembled, the operator pushes this lever over here. That sends that line of matrix over to the casting area where the machine literally pumps molten metal. It's melting this ingot right here. That's type metal. Once it has cast the line of type, it's ejected down here. It, the machine then takes all of the matrix back up to the top of the machine and by the operation of that spiraling mechanism drops the matrix back into the correct channels. So the matrix are constantly circulating through the machine and when he's finished his story, sometimes they refer to it as a lift, they'll pick, pick that up and take it to the composing stone where they make up the page. They'll lock that in this very special chase that's used for stereotyping. They then put that through a very high pressure roller with that white material. Now, the best explanation I have for that is it's super tough paper mache. Uh, it can also be referred to as flong. Once it goes through the high pressure roller, the flong can then be placed in a casting box, but instead of holding it flat, it holds it in a curve. It's flooded with type metal, and you get a curved press plate. 
Those press plates are then put on the press units in the press. They go together to, to, to by to form a complete circle like that. And the press units are four plates wide. So one revolution of that press unit prints eight pages of the newspaper. Now on the web press, typically you have eight units. So it will produce a 64 page paper. One of the interesting stories about the linotype is that when Mr. Mergenthaler was demonstrating to his financial backers, he had cast several lines of type and somebody in the back of the room supposedly has said, Otmar, you've done it. You've cast a line of type. Hence the name of the machine, the linotype. Now, I don't know if there's really basis in fact or if that's one of those stories that, that goes along uh, through history. It's come down to be, to be gospel, but who, who knows for sure. But it makes a good story. Mr. Mergenthaler uh, met his demise from tuberculosis. If he had lived, who knows what he could have uh, invented along the way. He, he was a, a very prolific uh, inventor. Uh, if a problem was pointed out to him on the machine, he would immediately work to rectify that problem and then modify all of the machines that they had put out to take care of that problem. So uh, linotype machines were almost always pretty much up to date. They did require a lot of maintenance. Uh, usually the, the linotype mechanics would, would work in pairs. And there were some operations that of course the operator could take care of, uh, the daily, certain daily lubrication points and things like that, cleaning space bands. Uh, but then there were uh, weekly and monthly uh, inspections that were required. The weekly was pretty, pretty easy, pretty quick. The monthly required a partial teardown of the whole machine so that they could measure for wear and adjust a lot of different things on the machine. Uh, so with the operators, the mechanics, uh, everything else going on, uh, a lot of people were employed. However, it did put a lot of hand compositors out of work. So uh, it had its good points and its bad points. It was used up until about the mid-1970s, and, and that I say about because there's no hard and fast point where papers or printing shops quit using the, the linotype and went over to what's called offset printing. 